The chair notes the time is 6.03. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge, and as ZBA chair, I want to welcome everyone to this meeting. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth for the purpose of promoting the health, safety, convenience, and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with provisions of Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties at interest. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 22 of the Acts of 2022, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. We will begin with a roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Ms. Tammy Parks? Here. Mr. Dylan Maxfield? Here. Mr. Craig Meadows? Here. Mr. John Gilbert? Present. I also want to note the presence of our associate member, Ms. Sarah Marshall. Here, yep. Also attending the public hearing tonight um, is Maureen Pollock, planner in the town. Uh, Maureen, is anybody else from the town? Yes, not, uh, we not... have uh, the sustainability director, uh, Stephanie Ciccarello, and uh, uh, building commissioner, Rob Mora, and planning director, uh, Christine Brestrup, uh, will be joining us shortly. They're um, in another meeting at the moment. All right. And also, Jonathan Murray of the KP Law Firm is attending. Tonight's agenda, new business, Zoning Board of Appeals training on land use permitting for solar, solar array installations and standalone battery energy storage systems under the Amherst Zoning Bylaw and Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 3. Discuss which topics are reasonable to require a third party review through Massachusetts General Laws, Chapter 44, Section 53G, and discuss what types of conditions the Zoning Board of Appeals can impose on a solar array installation permit or on a standalone battery, battery energy storage system permit. After that, there'll be a general public comment period on matters not before the board tonight and any other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours. Tonight, we are joined by members of the Solar Bylaw Working Group. Uh, Chairman Berger, are you, there you are. Chairman Berger, as chair of the Solar Bylaw Working Group, do you want to open your group's meeting? My understanding is that we do not have a quorum. You do not have a quorum. Correct. Okay. Um, oh. Go ahead. I, I can just introduce uh, myself as being a member and the chair of the of the uh, uh, working working group. The the Amherst Solar Work uh, Bylaw Working Group and Jack uh, Jemsick also is a member and i think that's who we have here tonight that's that's who you have so you don't have a quorum so you won't be able to um officially conduct business and um comment because of the open meeting law yep. um you'll all be you'll be as um uh, participant our attendees not participants and if that should change let us know i mean if you get a quorum let us know and we'll bring you in but um okay. until that happens Yep, You'll we'll be... participate. <laughs> <laughs> As members of the public, okay? Exactly, thank you. All right. Before we begin the presentation by Jonathan Murray of the KP Law Firm, I thought it would be helpful for members of the ZBA to have an update on the site assessment being conducted by the town to determine the appropriate placement of solar arrays and for the progress and development of an, the new solar bylaw. Um, I had hoped that uh, Either Chris might be able to pre pre uh, preside, present the um, how the um, um, site assessment is going on, but perhaps Miss um, is it Chicarello might be able to uh, update us on that briefly. Yes, thank you so much. Um, 
I appreciate that. And I've been uh, managing the solar assessment project for the town. Uh, we're working with GZA Environmental. Uh, they've been meeting with me on a fairly regular basis. And we also have a working group, a sub working group that's been working with them as well. That includes Dwayne Breger, who is both the Energy and Climate Action Committee liaison, as well as the Solar Bylaw Working Group Chair. Chris Brestrup, the planning director, myself, and also Mike Warner from our T IT department. Um, and we've been working to determine what is the best methodology to use in order to conduct the assessment. Uh, the assessment will really be just a general look at what is feasible for development in the town. It will not include the university or the two college campuses or their land holdings. So it will only be town land, um, business property and private property. Uh, again, it will only be um, to look at what's feasible. It will not be specific beyond that as to exactly what can be developed. Uh, the criteria is still being developed as well. And we will update you as we move along in that process. Thank you. Um, I note that um, Ms. Brestrup has attended the meeting um, and we, we just went through the uh, site assessment um, status report. Ms. Brestrup, do you wanna just let us, uh, give us a brief uh, status report on where we are with a, Z, with a solar bylaw and what the, the timetable is to, uh, to inform the ZBA members of when they could expect to see a, a zoning bylaw, a, a new solar bylaw. Certainly. I'm Chris Brestrup, Planning Director. I think I know all of you. Um, so good evening. Um, the Solar Bylaw Working Group is working on uh, a solar bylaw. Their deadline for um, having something ready to send to town meeting is um, the end of May in 2023. So, um, you know, you're probably not going to have a solar bylaw really to be realistic until sometime next summer, because once it goes to town council, town council will need to refer it to the planning board and the CRC for public hearings, and that could take a few months. And then um, both of those bodies need to make a recommendation to the town council, and then it needs to go back to the town council. So it's going to be a while. So you're going to be, um, <clears throat> you know, working um, with without uh, a specific solar bylaw for a while. Um, but we're working diligently and um, making progress. Thank you. Um, so I guess one of the things that I wanna point out to the members of ZBA is we're, I think, highly likely to see some applications for solar arrays, uh, special permits, before we have a bylaw, this training is designed to give us um, an, uh, a background on what has what the state of the current law is in the state, the uh, sort of condition of the qualities and characteristics of the conditions that we would need to consider to approve that bylaw um, in the absence of approve that application in the absence of a bylaw. So this is something that would probably be, it'd be helpful for us to have this background. Uh, as we deal with um, solar applications prior to the, the adoption of a new solar bylaw. Um, before we go to Mr. Murray, I, what I, we had, Mr. Murray and I had discussed the best way for his presentation to go, and I think the best way to have a, a consistent and concise presentation. What, I, what we thought was best is that Mr. Murray would present the first half of his presentation, we'd break and give everybody a chance to ask questions, and then he presents the second half of the presentation and everybody could ask questions after that. In this way, we're not kind of interrupting him unless it's absolutely urgent. There's something you don't understand uh, that ne really needs to be clarified at that point. But generally questions, let's, let's give him a chance to give a presentation, half his presentation, open it up for questions, and then complete the presentation at that point. All right, um, Mr. Murray, do you want to proceed? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, my name is Jonathan Murray. I'm an attorney at KP Law. Uh, just very briefly before I, get, I begin, my practice area involves land use, permitting and zoning matters, uh, drafting and adopting of zoning bylaws, granting of permits, variances, comprehensive permits, and then uh, enforcement of zoning and other uh, local and state codes. So 
Uh, I'm familiar with the zoning um, aspect and especially the solar aspect has begun a, a hot button issue for many communities over the past two to three years. Um, before I was uh, practicing at KP Law, I was a law clerk at the land court. Uh, and I think I told the chairman, I unfortunately wrote a few decisions that many communities don't appreciate in the matter of solar. So I apologize, but I can at least speak uh, with some, at least some expertise on those. Um, so uh, let me see here, I will share my screen. Okay, uh, I'm not an expert in this. So would someone just mind confirming that you can see? Yep, we've got it. Okay, can see perfect. it well. Thank you. Um, you would think after a few years, I would get this Zoom thing down, but it's always, uh, it's always uh, tricky in the moment. So um, just a little background. Um, originally, the solar bylaw working group had presented a list of questions uh, regarding the drafting uh, an impl implementation of a, a solar zoning bylaw. Uh, and I copied the Zoning Board of Appeals on that memo, and I hope if you haven't had an opportunity to, to review it, you might have some time to digest it in the, in the coming weeks. Uh, but that, I hope, gives a good overview of um, the current state of the law and some of their questions that might be relevant to what your board uh, might face in the coming months, uh, especially matters within your jurisdiction. Uh, but this presentation, as the chairman said, ho I hope to give you an overview of what the Zoning Act says, especially in regards to uh, solar uses and battery uses. Uh, and then after we break for questions, my second half, I'd like to get uh, into examples of bylaws that are permissible under the law, at least what courts and the Attorney General has said is permissible and what is not permissible. Um, so obviously disclaimer, this is for educational uses only and uh, you know, if there's a specific questions, please reach out to planning staff or my office or KP Law in general. Um, so like I said, we're going to, I'd like to first start with the two, uh, the first two bullets, overview of the Dover Amendment, as it's called, and then overview of the Tracer Lane decision, which was the first appellate decision we have in Massachusetts, came out this summer and uh, analyzes the provisions of the Zoning Act pertaining to solar uses. Uh, after we break for questions, uh, I'd like, again, to talk about some considerations in light of recent attorney general decisions, uh, and then some more broadly uh, question and answer. Um, so what is the Dover Amendment? Um, general Laws, Chapter 40A, Section 3, uh, the Zoning Act, is commonly referred to as the Dover Amendment. Um, I would say if we were being pedantic, which I've been accused of in the past before, uh, Section 3, in reality, is not entirely the Dover Amendment. It's a specific paragraph in Section 3, but you will commonly hear people refer to all of Section 3 as the Dover Amendment. So I, I just use that terminology because that's probably what you'd like to see or what you're, uh, I anticipate you might see or people talk about um, um, in discussion of, of these provisions. And so the legislature adopted Section 3 and the Dover Amendment originally to prevent municipalities from res re restricting educational and religious use of land. Uh, it was a case out of the town of Dover where, uh, where they prohibited a parochial school in a particular zoning district. Uh, in response to that, the legislature carved out zoning exemptions for religious uses and educational uses. Um, and since that time, that was uh, in the mid 20th century, the legislature has slowly been adding to that list. Um, and, and generally, the Dover Amendment and the provisions in Section 3 limit the authority of municipalities and limit the authority of permit granting authorities and special permit granting authorities um, in regards to particular uses. And so this is a, a, a general list of those uses that the municipalities and permit granting authorities have a limited jurisdiction or limited authority to condition. They include agricultural, religious, educational, solar, the reason we're here tonight, um, the interior areas of residential buildings, um, things that would be covered by the building code or the electrical code or plumbing code, things like that, uh, child care, structures destroyed by fire, and antennas. So like ham radio antennas. Um, I would just give everyone, um, you know, I'm sure these are things that you all have dealt with in your capacity as board members in the past, but I would just say, uh, you know, we're going to talk about solar uses tonight. 
but be aware that each of these has a particular standard that, bo that boards and towns have to apply. The legislature didn't in, uh, enact standardized um, criteria. So what may be true for solar is not necessarily true for agricultural and religious and educational. So just as a general matter, be aware that while these uses have zoning exemptions or zoning protections under section three, uh, they're applied a little bit differently depending on what use there is. Uh, but like I said, reason we're here is solar uses. Um, solar was added in 1985 um, and that was uh, part of the legislature's intent to protect solar panels from uh, local regulation or uh, overburden local reg regulation. I would note um, just if folks are interested in this, there's a there's a thought or there's a um, a discussion about really what was the intent of the legislature in 1985. Some folks think that the legislature didn't anticipate these large ground mounted solar projects that we now see today where dozens of acres are taken up by ground mounted. Some think it was just intended for roof mounted, um, but that's kind of just a purely academic thought at this point. Um, the, the state of the law is that whether you're on the ground or on the roof or over a cranberry bog, the provisions of section three apply to these solar uses. Um, and so this is the key phrase here and I'm just trying to get, see if I can get my, uh, uh, there we go. I, my, the pictures there were blocking my view. Um, so this is really the key language and um, I'll, I'll comment on it in a second, but it says no zoning ordinance or bylaw shall prohibit or unreasonably regulate the installation of solar energy systems or the building of structures that facilitate the collection of solar energy, except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, public health, safety, or welfare. Um, and so I think there's two really key things if you take anything from what I'm discussing tonight is bylaws can't prohibit or unreasonably regulate. Um, and the exception to that is except where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. So I think prohibit is generally understood. You can't prohibit solar installations. There's a series of cases out of the land court where the court, while we don't have appellate um, review of these cases, that court has struck down zoning bylaws that prohibit uh, solar from entire districts. Um, for example, there were there's two cases one out of the town of Ware and one out of the town of East Longmeadow, where those communities prohibited all solar in all residential districts. And the court said that is an unreasonable regulation. Um, not only is it unreasonable, it's a straight up prohibition. And we think that that goes against the language of section three. Um, so that's one, we don't really have uh, appellate cases on that quite yet, but that's something folks should be aware of. The second thing, um, is that last, the last sentence or the last portion of the sentence, the accept clause, accept where necessary to protect the public health, safety, or welfare. And that's kind of where you all come in um, and where the Solar Bylaw Working Group will come in. When you're considering permits for these types of uses, this is going to be the theme in your head, or at least should be the theme in your head when you're either granting the permit or conditioning the permit. The, the statute prohibits unreasonable regulation except to protect the public health, safety, and welfare. So any condition um, that you might impose or consider imposing have, has to be very explicit and it has to be a very direct connection between the condition and the protection of those three things. Um, so, so really main point, key point here is no unreasonable regulation except if we're protecting public health, safety, or welfare. Um, and I'll, I'll continue on what that means in a moment. But unfortunately, as I, you know, I, I had a discussion with the chairman earlier, what is the public health, safety, or welfare is going to be different for each community. Um, it's going to be dependent on local needs, local conditions, and specific sites, uh, you know, project sites and, and that sort of thing. So um, this is truly a case-by-case -case basis. And while we can take general themes of it's improper to prohibit 
solar in your town, which obviously you're not proposing, but just as an example, you know, it would be impermissible to do that, you know, where you do condition or you do limit this use, you have to make a connection to public health, safety and welfare. Um, so that's kind of the really the key thing to think about. Um, okay, we'll just go back to this. So, uh, like I said, um, there has been really a lack of case law on this issue um, up until this summer. I will say when I clerked at the land court, uh, that would have been 2018 to 2019. That's when we first started seeing cases come through, um, really analyzing this issue. Prior to 2018, there were really four cases that discussed this solar provision of section three, and they per weren't particularly helpful for municipalities. But um, in June of 2022, the SGC finally took up this issue in a case called Tracer Lane. Uh, and, and I think it's really important to talk about it. One, because the attorney general has been strictly applying this case to, to, um, to new bylaws. And, and that's not particularly part of your calculus at this point. Uh, but you should just know that that will then inform, you know, how the courts are applying it. Um, and that also applies to zoning bylaws and if there's a zoning moratorium or something like that. So uh, I'll just briefly uh, explain the Tracer Lane case, kind of anticipate some questions, and then we'll take a pause and uh, I, I can hear if you have any questions. Uh, so Tracer Lane, the, the main issue in that case was the developer had proposed to construct a large scale ground mounted solar system in the neighboring town of Lexington. Um, in the Waltham portion, which is where this case aro arose from, um, they proposed to have an access road. Uh, and the city of Waltham determined that in the district where the access road was being proposed, they did not allow zoning uh, and they denied their permit for the access road, not, not even for the the structure itself, but for the access code, uh, access road. Uh, that case was appealed to the land court. Um, and they, in the land court, and subsequently the appellate courts found that the access road was ancillary to the solar structure and therefore was under the uh, umbrella of protection for section three, that ninth paragraph of section three, uh, because the access road was to facilitate the collection of energy, which is a protection in the Zoning Act. And they said that was um, a, 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 a use that was connected, uh, you know, close, closely enough connected to the, to the principal solar use to, to enjoy a protection. Um, so that was the first part of that case. The second part of that case was the prohibition. Uh, I mentioned that earlier where some communities have prohibited solar in blanket districts. Uh, the court found that Waltham's prohibition was unreasonable uh, because it only allowed for, for solar systems to be installed in 2% of the land area of town. And there was no provision in their zoning ordinance that had any reasonable basis in public health, safety, or welfare, which is why I've, re I've really trying to stress that phrase is because that's what the court's are, you know, that's what the SJC hung its hat on. That's what the attorney general has hung it, her hat on. Um, and that's kind of the phrase that we're left with at this moment. Um, and so here again is the holding, but you know, the key takeaway is when we impose conditions on solar uses or when we adopt solar bylaws, we have to have uh, the municipality, at least as far as we're sure right now, has to conduct and document its planning process um, in a way that articulates why they're adopting a regulation or why you're conditioning a project in relation to a reasonable health safety or welfare concern. Um, and, and generally these conditions and these bylaws should be aimed at least according to the courts to promoting solar rather than restricting solar. Um, and so that's kind of the balancing test that we have to undertake is do this, does this condition unreasonably regulate or unreasonably prohibit or is a back, back doorway to prohibit solar in the town or is it a reasonable regulation which not only promotes solar, which is a requirement of chapter 40A, 
but also protects health, safety, and welfare. Um, and so I will just um, perhaps take a moment to try to anticipate a few questions, and then I'll, I'll turn it back over to you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so like I said, what does it mean, reasonable health, safety, or welfare? I, I wish I could give you the, a, a definitive definition that, that made it very easy for you all to apply, but unfortunately, that doesn't exist. And it doesn't exist for a few reasons. One, it's different for every community. Uh, the town of Amherst is going to have different priorities and different concerns than the city of Cambridge or, you know, the town of Yarmouth or the city of Springfield. Uh, you know, there's there's different municipal concerns, different concerns throughout the state. Um, also, it's a case by case basis. I think um, you can certainly imagine scenarios where you have a solar installation on top of a hill and you have erosion concerns, or perhaps you have um, solar glare concerns if it's next to a residential house, or perhaps if it's near a school and there needs to be, you know, fencing or screening or anything to keep children away. You know, th there's, a, there's a million different scenarios you could think of. Uh, and so that's why uh, it's unfortunate I'm unable to give you like a particular definition. But like I said, those key takeaways, that phrase, health, safety, or, or welfare, those should be in the back of your head anytime you see an application uh, and you're considering um, imposing conditions is to say, you know, does this condition unreasonably regulate? No, and if not, you know, what's the connection? Why are we imposing this condition? Um, and if you're able to connect that to a health, safety, or welfare reason, the more likelihood, if it were ever appealed to a court, that a court would defer to your judgment. Because you all know the town better than the courts. Um, there is a a preference to defer to the to the local boards because they have local knowledge of both the bylaw and the facts of the case, um, but they won't defer if the condition is unreasonable. Um, so it's a balancing act. But um, uh, Mr. Chair, maybe if we pause here for a second and um, I can answer any questions or, or maybe just discuss further if anyone would like. Great. I do, I do have one question, and I want to make sure to open this up to <clears throat> all ZBA members. So, early, earlier in your presentation, you, you spoke about buildings. You, you couldn't unnecessarily or unreasonably prohibit or restrict buildings that facilitate the collection of solar energy. And then I noticed in that uh, one case, they, they dealt with um, making a, a road and the yeah. construction of a road. So, what what is all the protected, not only buildings, but activities that um, this, that, that the section three covers? Um, is it, obviously it's more than the building, it's more than the battery um, storage facility, it's more than the, the arrays. What all is covered? I mean, is it the construction, temporary construction um, um, mobile home that they use as an office? Is it, the, it's obviously the road in some cases, what else is covered and how, how broad is the protected class? Yeah, it, it's a pretty broad class in the sense that if if the use of a structure um, is connected to the collection of solar energy, it will be entitled to Section 3's protection. So if you had, for example, a mobile trailer or a, a you know, some sort of structure to keep storage items or roads or um, fencing or, or, or things like that, Any anything that can be reasonably connected um, to the collection of solar energy use will be entitled to the protection. So temporary temporary placement of construction materials for the time being um, until it's built and all, all that. So it's pretty broad in terms of what is protected. Yeah, it, it is pretty broad, but, but, but I would maybe give you the caveat to say like I said, the statute doesn't pro prohibit all regulation. It just prohibits yeah. unreasonable regulation. So yeah. if you were concerned about construction material, for example, I think a reasonable regulation might be, for, you know, you know, I don't know what that might be, but if it was a, a, you know, a pile of dirt, you know, if there was a lot of grading, you might have a reasonable condition to say, you know, you might cover it or, you know, have, you mm -hmm. know, dust mitigation plan or something like that, uh, because those types of conditions wouldn't, unreasonably prohibit the underlying solar use, it would just be we're going to protect, say, our the neighbors from dust from the construction yeah. activities, um, but you can still do the use. Uh, but uh, but to your question, it's a pretty broad class. 
And so long as the applicant, in my opinion, can show a connection between either the temporary use, the continuing use, or the structure, um, and how it supports energy collection, it's going to be entitled to zoning exemption. Thank you. Ms. Marshall. Yeah, I would just add on to Steve's question. I mean, the, the, the energy gener generated needs to be then transmitted. So does this also apply to transmission lines and, you know, the, the, the utility poles or can, can, uh, can the ZBA ask that they be buried if that's even possible? I don't know, but yeah, but it's not just generation. It has to. It's no good to anybody if it doesn't leave the site. So, yeah, you you bring up an excellent point, and it it leads me to the battery energy facilities that are are, are in this presentation as well. But I'll answer your question first. Uh, we should just be careful, especially with like uh, transmission lines. Those might be depending on the project and the size and everything like that. Like that. Those might be regulated under some sort of state statute, whether it be under the Department of Public Utilities or the Energy Siting um, Facility Board, which is a, a, a board within DPU, um, or it might be governed under the electrical code, you know, subset of the building code. Um, so to the extent that a transmission line is regulated by something from the state, the, the local municipality is preempted from regulating that. Um, so I would just caution boards, you know, when we get into that kind of thing, we should just be, you know, and that might be consulting with the building commissioner or my, you know, someone from my office or, or planning staff. Um, it might be preempted. So we might say town can't even touch it. You know, it's, it's governed under the state statute of the state regulation. If it's not, I, I would be, I would be hard pressed to think of an example where, where that type of use or that type of structure wouldn't also be protected by the zoning act um you know those supporting poles and everything like that uh, i would just say it, it it reminds me of the battery battery energy storage facilities you'll see that a lot with solar panels and instead of going back to the grid they put them in batteries that are also on site um the ag's office and the courts have said where batteries are associated with the solar panels they're also entitled to the Section 3 um, protection. Some communities, and I think Shootsbury and Ware and um, Medway, and I think Wareham, there's a few different communities out there. I'm just trying to think of you know, communities. Um, they regulate independent storage facilities, and that's uh, you know, independent battery storage facilities. And to be honest, I don't know practically how that works, whether they collect energy from the grid and then it goes into batteries or, or whatnot. Um, but the AG has kind of telegraphed that it may be permissible if they're independent and they're not associated with solar, communities might have um, jurisdiction over that. But then I, it goes back to the state preemption question of, do those battery storage facilities, are they regulated under the building code, the electrical code or anything like that? So. Um, that was a long-winded answer just to say, uh, yeah, it, transmission lines would likely be covered under Section 3, but I would think in the first instance, communities are probably preempted under some state regulation. Thank you. Other questions at this point in the presentation for Mr. Murray? Ms. Parks? I, I guess um, what's coming up for me is I'm just wondering if there are any issues with the battery storage facilities where they might be considered a nuisance, like by way of sound or electrical emission or something like that. I guess I don't know that 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 would fall towards the zoning board, but is that an issue that has been raised about solar fields? Yeah, it certainly has been raised by different communities. I would say in the first instance, um, Mass DEP has a comprehensive set of regulations uh, regarding noise from property and odor. Uh, it's odor, noise, and dust, I think, but it's noise and odor. Uh, and that's under the jurisdiction of the Board of Health. So I would say that there might be circumstances where 
um, the community is preemptive from specifically regulating issues regarding noise because the Board of Health already has jurisdiction under DEP regulations to address that. They also have broad jurisdiction under Chapter 111 to um, enforce or, or uh, take action against nuisances generally. Um, but to your question, I would say that, you know, to the extent that the board, this board or the town has jurisdiction over a battery facility or a solar facility, and you can identify on, in that particular application what might be a nuisance. Um, you know, perhaps location, you know, it's very close to a school or a residential area or something like that. You certainly can take reasonable regulations to address those nuisances. Um, but like I said before, so long as you connect them to public health, safety, and welfare. So um, I think noise, you could probably make a good argument to say, you know, this facility is so close that we are going to, you know, require this, this screening to protect public health because the noise emitted causes health concerns or, you know, something like that. Um, but I would say in the first instance, the Board of Health probably has um, sufficient jurisdiction to address the nuisance. Uh, but to the extent that it's not covered under those DEP regulations, you could you could impose reasonable conditions um, so long as those conditions weren't um, a, a back end to prohibit the use. Like um, I'm, I'm thinking, for example, setbacks. Uh, the AG has said you can impose a different set of setbacks for solar and and, and associated structures, but you couldn't require, say, uh, you know, a half a mile setback because that would just significantly reduce your land area you can use and it's a bat they think they think of it as an unreasonable back end to prohibit the use uh, but you know say your normal setbacks in the district were 50 feet and you said through the bylaw or whatever it may be you know uh, we think 100 feet because they emit this particular noise and that noise has a detrimental in impact on the on the neighborhood um it's a conversation worth having um but yeah, to answer your question, Board of Health is, is first and foremost in my mind about nuisances, but you can impose reasonable conditions to address potential nuisances. All right, I'm just not sure how we would know if, if someone was, was going to put it in installation. I, I, don't, I, don't know, I don't know if those battery storage units do make a sound or yeah. if they do emit something. So you, you certainly, well, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair. Well, I was just going to say, well, one thing that we, is available to us, and we've done it in one case earlier in a comprehensive permit, is 53G. If we need to have an out, if we feel as a board, we need additional information, we need to have it evaluated, we can use a provision of state law to require the applicant to uh, fund an outside um, consultant to give us, to answer the questions that we pose. So there is, there is not only the knowledge that we have and that the applicant and, and that our council would have, but we can go for outside help if we need it. I think that's one possibility, is it not, Mr. Murray? Oh, yes, that, that's exactly what I was going to say. There, there is a provision for uh, employing outside counsel. Certainly, you know, I, I went to law school. I didn't go to, uh, you know, I didn't get my electrical license. I don't know what sounds or, or dangers those emit, but you certainly could employ professionals who do have that expertise. It would be nice actually if we could visit sites at some point and just see if there is a, a sound or, you know, uh, any way, any other way it might be construed to be a nuisance. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Meadows. Um, there just, there really is no noise. Um, where if you go over to UMass, you will notice that there isn't any noise over by the Mullen Center. There's no noise uh, at the new system that they just put in by the administration building. Um, I, we're, we're dealing with a four and a half megawatt system down and adjacent to uh, a VA hospital in Houston. Uh, there's no noise. We're putting in battery energy storage. Um, we just finished up with the VA hospital with four megawatts in Las Vegas. There is no noise. Um, 
we put in a, a solar system at the uh, FAA in Corpus Christi. The one thing that we did have there is a requirement that the reflective light off of the system did not interfere with the with the tower and the line of sight of the of the uh, people in the tower who are bringing in the airplanes. That was very easily done. There was no problem. Um, I don't think that we're going to find that as a criteria uh, in anywhere in Amherst. I don't think we're going to see any problems with noise or any other hazards of that sort. Fencing, uh, we did have a, a project down in Connecticut at a housing authority where we did put fencing around the, the, the facility, around the solar, and we, and we dropped it below the line of sight from the roads because there, were, there was concern of the reflective glass and reflection of the sun might interfere with cars being driven by. Reasonable reflection, but if you drive down the Mass Pike, you'll see solar all along the pike. Uh, that was installed by Amoresco. There, I haven't seen any reflectivity problems on the pike. I don't think you're going to, given the way that they're situated. As long as things are situated properly, that typically solar is not going to be a problem. Can I just ask quickly, um, for battery storage, does that generate any heat? Not really. Okay. That's, I was just wondering if the batteries, you know, where the transformer is, if it heats up and needs to be cooled down or anything like that. No. Um, we haven't found any situation where that, that would be a problem. Um, there are different types of battery energy storage systems. Uh, and some people have been indicating a desire to use lead acid batteries um, and build larger structures to house them. Uh, very inexpensive way uh, to use that instead of using um, more, uh, more minerals that need to be mined around the world for rare minerals. Um, there's a lot of discussion about what could be used instead of uh, the current uh, battery energy storage systems. And perhaps that might be something, and, and I guess that's a question um, as to whether there can be a restriction on the amount of um, rare minerals that are used in any specific solar system, uh, battery energy storage system. Um, that would be used in the town. It, it, is, is that something that might be considered? I wouldn't say no. And to be honest, I, I, I don't, you know, I, it sounds like you have more expertise and professional knowledge about this than, than I do. But I would say, again, what the court is going to look at is, you know, why is the town imposing that condition, whether it be the board or through the bylaw is, you know, how does the restriction on those rare materials in the battery system protect the public health, safety, and welfare? And could there be a less restrictive way to achieve the same goal? So, um, you know, it might be that a court might say, you know, you can't outright prohibit or limit those, but you could input or require, you know, decommissioning bonds or decommissioning plans or, you know, hazard mitigation plans or whatever it might be. I think I would need to know a little bit more about the rationale behind the, the limitation and then what we would do is connect that or try to connect that to public health, safety and welfare. Uh, uh, rare, rare earth minerals are, are found in usually in poor countries. Uh, they're mined in ways that use a lot of resources, particularly water. Um, it's a matter of whether you can uh, equate the mining of those minerals with climate conditions. And if you can, does that make any difference as far as the court's concerned? It might. And, and I, I wish I could say yes or no, it might. Um, it's just going to depend on, you know, the way that the court is going to look at it is to say, you know, what connection to the community, you know, how is this protecting the public health, safety and welfare? And you, I, I suppose you can make an argument that 
the public health would include, you know, generally climate change. Uh, but that might be a harder sell. And I, I apologize, that kind of sounded like I was, you know, I, my thought process is the court is going to be more convinced, I think, in my opinion, about the protection of the local community, the health, safety, and welfare of the citizens of Amherst and the surrounding communities, rather than the the world at large, as maybe that's a policy decision that should change. But I think I think they would be more convinced by saying, if we limit these types of materials, they will have this positive effect, or they will have uh, this protective effect for our citizens. That's a more convincing argument than to say we're going to limit the types of materials you can use in this facility because it's going to help climate change in general. I think it's too loose and it's too um, amorphous for a court to really grab onto. I would also just caution to say when we start getting into building materials and the types of materials used in um, construction of these facilities, if it's a matter that's governed under the building code, then I would say no. Um, if the building code says you can use these these types of batteries so long as you do X, Y, Z, uh, the board shouldn't go near it because that the building code trumps local concern in, the, in regard to building matters. If the electrical code says you can use these materials so long as you do X, Y, Z, the electrical code is, is you know, trumps it. Um, so I don't wanna say no, but I think we would need to be very clear on, is this preempted by state law or regulation? Um, and if not, how how does this protect public health, safety, and welfare? And then third, if it does, is there a less restrictive means we could do this? Meaning, could you still use those materials but provide mitigation or emergency planning or bonds or decommissioning plans, something of the like? Um, unfortunately, I can't give you a yes or no, but I hope that's at least a little bit helpful. At the risk of kind of going into the rabbit hole here, let me just posit a question. Uh, hypothetical. Say that the, and this is purely hypothetical, say that there's concern amongst the board that certain materials used in the batteries could degrade, could um, explode, or could in some way um, uh, be released to the town and to the mm -hmm. neighboring area, even though those materials are permitted by the electrical code or the, or the state building code. Um, but if, if if they had a, a well if they had a concern about that, mm -hmm. would the the board's restriction likely be overturned because or the board's condition that those materials not be used in the batteries be likely overturned because there are the uh, the, the state electrical code or the state building code permits it? Is that what you're saying? Uh, that's my that's my gut, just in a hypothetical. Yeah, any... yeah, it's a hypothetical, and I'm not even sure it's a real concern, but I'm just trying yeah. to get a feel for the yeah I, I would say an outright prohibition if it's if it's governed by a state code or regulation it would the town yeah. town prohibition would be pr prohibited what you could do say for example that you know and this is getting into technical things that you know, i i don't have great knowledge on but you could imagine a scenario where you say you know this particular type of battery or this particular arrangement of batteries is permitted under the building code um, and they did all the safety features, but you as a board say, well, we have wetlands here, or we have uh, sensitive mm -hmm. habitats or anything like that. And what we'd like as a reasonable condition for you to do is, you know, you know, provide, you know, some sort of buffering or some sort of container or some sort of uh, a general inspection reporting. You know, you have to report in once a year to make sure that they're in good working condition reasonable things that don't necessarily prohibit, prohibit, prohibit those uses, but then still address the concern of these are materials yeah. that we don't exactly want in the town, but we want to make sure that they're safe. So reporting, screening, containment, those conditions are more likely to pass judicial scrutiny than to say not allowed at all. Right. Okay. That's helpful. Other questions? Um, for Mr. Murray, if not, we can move on to the second part of your presentation. But I don't want to. I do not want to um, take away the opportunity for board members to ask questions. Okay. All right, Mr. Murray, go ahead. Sure. Let me share this again. Uh, 
Uh, so we finished on Tracer Lane. Um, so I, I just like to take a few minutes to talk about uh, general uh, other communities bylaws. And I know this is the zoning board. I put this in uh, partially for the solar bylaw working groups benefit, but I think this is just helpful. So you kind of know where other communities are on the issue. I won't read these out uh, verbatim, but I would just point out like, for example, um, in the Hopkinton case, the town extensively studied the impacts presented and created a, a pretty lengthy record regarding public health, safety, and welfare. The attorney general was satisfied by that. In contrast, in Wareham, where they tried to adopt a bylaw that limited um, the acreage and didn't list a public health, safety, or welfare reason, uh, the AG said, no, that's an unreasonable regulation, and you haven't sufficiently explained why the community should be allowed to um, have that regulation. Um, so again, similar to Hopkinton, the town of Washington had um, uh, imposed or adopted regulations. So as to further their goal of being a green community, uh, which is a state program, uh, the AG said that was fine. Um, and then the Spencer case, uh, I would just note the Spencer AG decision came out before the Tracer Lane um, SJC case. So we're not particularly sure if if the AG were given this bylaw again, if they would approve it. Um, but at the time, um, they said 100 to 300 foot setbacks and other regulations were permissible, but town be cautious, um, you know, careful where you go. Um, so again, uh, other things that were fine, site plan review, um, additional requirements for agricultural use or open space use. Uh, we talked about it briefly, but, um, Oh yeah, bonds for decommissioning and removal. Uh, I would just note that there's a particular requirement under Chapter 44 Municipal Finance Statute on how you handle those. Those would be worked into a bylaw or regulation if if the town were interested in that. But um, I would I would just flag that um, wholesale cutting of trees. Uh, that's a that's an interesting topic. Um, towns are really wrestling with this because of the the public health concern with clear cutting trees and and shade and and you know the positive effects of having forest land um we don't have a great sense of where the courts fall on that one um but the ag i think at least in the medway case which was earlier this year uh tentatively said that that that's probably okay um and then again uh requirements for pollinator friendly planting um, especially if those requirements are connected with, like, say, agriculture land or specific habitats or, or things like that, uh, those those were presume we presume that those are reasonable. Um, disapproved unreasonable things, um, prohibition on the use of pesticides, herbicides, fertilizer. Um, that's under Department of Agricultural Resources jurisdiction, similar to like the building code conversation and the DPU conversation. Uh, if the state regulates it, generally the towns are preempted from conditioning. Um, so something to keep aware of that those types of conditions might not be permissible or generally not permissible. Um, again, restrictions of the parcel size, the three to 10 acres with the, was the Wareham example that was disapproved this year, earlier this year. Um, that's not to say that the towns couldn't restrict the size of these parcels. Uh, but Wareham didn't give a reason for it. So the AG said it, it's not sufficiently connected to public health, safety, or welfare. Uh, again, the, the removal of trees, that was Wareham as well. Um, and ultimately, like I said, anything not grounded in the protection of public health. Um, you know, I, I, I know I'm a broken record. I think my wife has heard me give this presentation a few times earlier today. I think she could, you know, give that as well. I've said it so many times, but... Um, yeah, it's uh, it's something really important for conditioning these applications. Um, very quickly, just want to talk about battery energy storage systems. Um, like I said earlier, when they're connected to a solar use, presume that they're entitled to the Section Three protections. Um, this is not uh, where, where I say approved definition. I just want to clarify: uh, it was an, a definition approved by the AG. It's not like a, a definition set in statute. So you could have something a little bit different, uh, but this was the town of Medway that they got um, this definition approved. Um, 
So it's just something if you want to go back and look at what per perhaps might be permissible to regulate, that's that's an improved definition. Um, again, when they cover direct connection to solar energy, they have protected status. Um, cannot interfere with the jurisdiction of the Energy Facility Siting Board. I think I mentioned that at the beginning, but it's a board within the Department of Public Utilities. They have they have jurisdiction over larger scale projects relating to um, energy facilities. So that would be, um, you know, electric transmission stations, natural gas, uh, fuel, geothermal, that, that sort of thing. Um, if it's under the jurisdiction of that board, the town is also preempted. Same thing with the building code, preempted. I kind of jumped the gun on that discussion, but here's a slide about it. Um, um, here's an example. Uh, Montague had a, a, a bylaw recently that was approved um, that didn't violate Section 3 when it came to battery energy storage uh, systems. Um, they were allowable by special permit. Small scale were allowed by right as accessory regulations to encourage co-locations and requirements for pollinator friendly plantings. I would just note again, you know, the, the purpose, or at least the court's stated purpose for section three is um, to encourage solar and not prohibit it. And so where the AG says to encourage co-location co siting with solar facilities, um, that is persuasive, at least so far as we've seen to the attorney general to say, um, you know, where regulations are aimed to promote it, subject to reasonable regulations, they're more likely to pass um, scrutiny by both the AG and the courts. Um, so something to keep in mind of. And of course, if you all look back through these, these slides and, and the memo I prepared, which I cite a few decisions, and uh, you'd like me to send you those decisions, or at least the website that you can pull them off of, I'm, I'm very happy to do that. Um, sometimes the AG has some helpful language or, or insight into what they were thinking. Uh, so if there's a particular interest or particular case, just let me know and I'll, I'll shoot it over by email to one of the staff. Um, I would just also note, uh, Amherst really doesn't, uh, I would say, uh, there's, a, there's a concept called du dual use solar. Right now it's quite contentious down um, South Shore, Cape Cod, Bristol County area, uh, particularly because of cranberry bogs. What we've been seeing a lot in a lot of communities is that you'll have your cranberry bogs and then they'll stick the solar panels, you know, maybe 10 or 12 feet above the cranberry bogs. So you can grow your cran cranberries, but then have solar above. That's called dual use solar. That's been encouraged by, um, encouraged by the state. Um, also in the latest round of, uh, of, of acts that the legislature, um, enacted, they amended the tax statute, the tax exemption statute to encourage that. Um, they also said that where you have this dual use solar, you know, that solar and the, and the land is entitled to the section three protection. So Amherst might have it in the sense of agricultural land. Definitely, I don't think there are any cranberry bogs, at least the last time I was in Amherst um, a few years ago at this point, but uh, no cranberry bogs, but yeah, definitely farmland and um, that sort of thing. So uh, it might be something to consider just generally in the conversations, maybe particularly more for the solar bylaw working group, but just for the ZBA to know is um, that the state and the AG look favorably upon, you know, encouragement or reasonable conditions on dual use um, as a productive use of land. Um, so, so generally, uh, I, you know, just to kind of close it out, I, I know I've said it a million times before, but when we're imposing conditions and we're considering these applications, uh, it's it's can't stress the importance of saying how do how does the condition relate to public health, safety, and welfare, and is there a less restrictive means? Um, because at the end of the day, when the court looks at this case and the you know if an applicant were to appeal a denial or appeal a condition. Their argument is going to be the restriction is so unreasonable and so burdensome that we can't do our solar use. And, and the way to succeed, or at least the, the path that we might be most successful is to say in your decisions, in your conditions, um, especially if we engage consultants and they can give this technical background is to say, 
the reason we, we impose this condition is because X, Y, Z, our consultants studied it and they said X, Y, Z, and here's our connection to public health or safety or welfare. Um, if, if boards and, and I haven't worked with you all on one of these projects yet, but in other communities and other boards, I've seen conditions that say, um, you know, let, no more than 10% shall be used for solar. And the court says, well, why on earth do you, did you say that? You didn't provide any rationale. You didn't say why this is needed. Why couldn't they use 15% or 12% or whatever it may be? And we get into a position where there may be a good reason why the board said that, or there, there may be a reason why this is a really important issue and there's a protection. You know, a, As the zoning board, you want to protect the community and protect uh, the neighbors. And there may be a really good reason, but unless we put it down on paper, and unless we explain ourselves probably more clearly and more explicitly than we do in other types of permits, um, there, there is a great risk that a court could strike it down. Um, so I think you know, there's some resources there. If, uh, I think that's more for the bylaw group, but um, uh, the, uh, the first link is to those attorney general decisions. Uh, so just in conclusion, I would say, you know, the, this board, if it's considering a solar application, um, is not outright prohibited from imposing conditions. That's not what the statute says. Um, but we have to be very careful with what conditions we do. And um, I'll say it one last time, they have to be reasonable, they have to be narrowly ta tailored, uh, and they have to be connected to the public health, safety and welfare, because uh, if not, and if it's not explained sufficiently, um, the decision could be bounced back by either the land court or the superior court. Um, and that's certainly not something I'd like to see for the board or the town. So uh, that's kind of, if you take anything away from that is, you know, details, explicit and connection. Um, uh, so that's kind of the, the, the end. I would just say once again, um, I, I prepared a memo for the bylaw working group. I, I provided a lot more detailed explanation about 40A3, why it's in the law, how it's applied. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, um, please you know, maybe grab it from one of the staff members and just take a look because it might give you a little more detail and a little more case law about it. Um, but, but that's the general overview. And uh, Mr. Chair, if we want to take some more questions. Yep, it's a good time for more questions. I would echo what you said. I did, did have a chance to read your memo. I think it's really helpful. Um, and it provides a lot of information and gives me a lot of background information. And I'd also say just one other thing. Um, we are, if, to the extent that we deal with applications for permitting solar arrays, we're gonna be doing it without the guidance of a, of a bylaw. We're gonna be doing it on our own. We're gonna to have to use our judgment and we're gonna to have to make sure that we refer it back to those three, quality, three criteria that uh, you've stressed so often. Um, public health, welfare, and safety. So um, I guess I'd leave it at that and open it up for questions from members um, of the ZBA. Steve? Ms. Marshall. So, yes, yeah. I just I just want to be clear in my mind about this. This, this um, Dover Amendment doesn't exempt projects from complying with existing regulation, you know, about wetlands or whatever, whatever is in the zoning law, in the zoning bylaw, you're just describe, you're just telling us that we can't impose additional constraints that aren't well founded. Is that correct? Well, I would say apart from zoning, other guide, you know, other sets of criteria. So if they're yeah. You know, under the the Wetlands Protection Act, or you know, local wetlands bylaw, or um, you know, say for example, if they needed subdivision or anything like that, you know, you have to require that. Um, to your point about zoning, I would say, and I see that Christine has her hand up, but I would say that there might be circumstances where an existing provision of the bylaw is unreasonable. I'm not saying that that's true, but many communities. Have, a, have an issue where they're, the existing bylaws on the book, courts have now said in, in light of Tracer Lane, that is an unreasonable regulation. 
Um, Even so if it I wasn't think, it wasn't established because of yeah to, to, to deter solar projects. Right. Oh, I see. Oh. So okay. so there there could be on re, you know say for example this is hypothetical say for example uh, a, a town a year ago said uh, solar is required to have a thousand foot setbacks and it's on the books and it was approved. I think in light now in light of Tracer Lane and in light of all these cases we might say. Boards, you might not want to apply that regulation or that provision of the bylaw because courts will find it to be unreasonable. Authority to. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Ms. Brush up. Thank you. Um, I think I know most of you. I'm Chris Brester, planning director. Um, and um, I had a question, or I really just had a statement, and, and maybe it's a question. Um, we have zoning regulations, and we've had, I think, four or five zone, uh, solar arrays installed in town. And the zoning board has um, used the zoning regulations that we have in place, including for setbacks and fence height and um, lot coverage and all those all those kinds of things and building coverage i think although rob morris here he'll know more about that um i think he interprets solar arrays as structures but i'm not absolutely sure about that but anyway i just wanted to say that um, we do have these um zoning um regulations in place and those have been used in the past to um review and then condition solar arrays in town so you're not you know flying blind you're not out there with not, no regulations at all and i just wanted i wondered if jonathan murray would comment on that um yes and i apologize if i gave the impression to say that any portion of your regulations were impermissible i'm, I'm not making any comment on what you have on the books already um, and you should use those regulations, you know, you're, you're required to follow what the bylaws and the regulations say. Um, I, I would just say, in general, this is, I think my comment was more that this is evolving every day. Um, we don't have, you know, definitive guidance from the courts and the AG. Uh, and so some towns find themselves in positions where they try to apply unreasonable regulations, and they get you know, criticized by the court or struck down or whatever, but I am certainly not making that comment for you all. I'm, I'm not making any comment on any particular ones. I just wanted to raise that as, as just a comment on this is a moving target, unfortunately. And um, it's, I think that's just something for every community and every board. It's a moving target and um, it's, it's requires a case by case analysis. You know, I think Apologies. one of the things that, that um, Ms. Brestra mentioned is um, 10.38 is is our zoning bylaw that deals with a lot of the questions regarding public health and safety and nu nuisance and that's what we've used i mean it's ex ex extensive it's not specifically directed towards solar but that's the the framework in which we've tried to make decisions in the past on solar arrays and 10.38 and provides some guidance in, on these questions generally and i think that's what you're pointing to isn't it chris I was pointing to that, but also we have dimensional regulations yep, and yep. other regulations throughout the bylaw, fence height, you know, setbacks of fences that are over six feet high and all of those kinds yep. of things that the board can use to guide it in, in reviewing projects. Um, one quick question that I, are standalone battery energy storage systems protected under section three? By the, current state, the current state of the law is standalone battery systems not associated with solar are not entitled to section three protection so they're not protected that's the current state of the law okay but if they're connected in any way to solar yeah. they are they are entitled to the section three protection okay so it's a solar it's a solar connection literally yeah, <laughs> that literally. makes a difference there okay all yeah. right uh mr meadows i see you have your hand up Given the fact that until there is a, a solar bylaw that um, the town feels will fly uh, with the courts, and that's going to be next summer, and we we in in any case will probably find 
that we're going to get a petition for a solar array somewhere in town between now and then. Um, because we, uh, you say we're not flying blind, no, but at the same time, there may be things that we would like to, to ask of the solar uh, installer um, and asking of them as opposed to requirements uh, usually gets some of the things that we want. Um, <laughs> is there any reason not to ask? Um, no, you can ask. I think voluntary concessions by an applicant, so long as they're voluntary and not connected to, you know, you know, unless you do this, we're not going to approve the permit. You know, if you say, you know, we're concerned about X, would you consider putting this up? I think that's perfectly fine. Other questions? Okay. Um, well, Mr. Murray, I found this very enlightening. Um, I've, I've learned a lot. I think it guides, and I, and I do, again, I would commend your memo to the members of the ZBA to take a look at that. It provides even more in-depth um, information I think is really helpful. So I would encourage you to take a look at that. Um, if we don't have any other questions from board members, um, I do want to just one thing I, I want to acknowledge. Mr. Marshall is here, Doug Marshall, chairman of the planning board. They didn't have an official meeting, but I always want to acknowledge a, another chair of another town committee. Um, I do want to then go to public comment. Um, if there's no other questions from the board, no other qu nothing else Mr. Murray wishes to say, um, I'd go to, we go, we can proceed to public comment, which is the next order of business. And that is uh, public comment from any member of the public on any matter that's not before the board tonight. So anything but solar away, not solar um, sites and applications and conditioning. And other than that, well, we're happy to entertain a three minute comment from members of the public. So if you wish to, if you wish to speak, uh, please indicate so by raising your hand uh, virtually and uh, the staff will try to identify you and then you identify yourself and you have three minutes to speak. I'm not seeing any raised hands. Great. There's no questions. Is there any uh, old any new business not within the last 40 hours uh, to raise members of the CBA? All right. If, oh, Ms. Presto, my hand is up. This question doesn't necessarily relate to ZBA work, but it relates to writing a, so, a solar bylaw. So I thought I would just take this opportunity to ask it. We've asked the question of ourselves. Um, would it be possible to use land under APR to um, have um, a dual use, you know, with solar and whatever kind of farming is going on there? Is that ever done or is that completely foreign to the APR um, process? Is that a question for me? That would be a question for Jonathan if he's able to answer that. Um, I would just say generally dual use solar on agricultural land has been encouraged by the state. Um, I don't know the details of perhaps what you're talking about um, APR wise, so I apologize, but I would just say generally both under um, state regulations, under the tax exemption statute and, and under 48.3, dual use is not only permitted, but encouraged. Thank you. All right, um, Maureen, our next meeting is the, is it the 15th of December or? Uh, one moment. Um, I believe it is, yes, the 15th, Thursday. Okay. The, 15th. the 15th, Thursday the 15th. At six o'clock. So yes, we will be, um, our ZBAs will see you all on the 15th. Until then, I hope you all have a great Thanksgiving. Um, it's the one time you can all eat too much and not feel guilty about it. I know I'm going to do the same. Um, oh. And we'll see you on Ms. Paula. Oh, I just, want, just wanted to say, so 
like all ZBA meetings, this uh, meeting has been recorded and will be uploaded to the ZBA YouTube channel um, in the probably in the next few days. So if at any time that someone wants to watch it for the first time or rewatch it, um, you can do so um, on the YouTube channel. Great. So I'd entertain a motion to adjourn our meeting. Do I have a motion? So moved. Ms. Parks, is there a second? Second. Oh, I'm not. Sorry. Well, I heard one, but I don't know from who. <laughs> but I, I, I thought it was Dilt, Mr. Maxfield. So we got. I'll give the second. I, I couldn't tell, but I heard a second. Um, this is a non-debatable motion. It's a roll call vote required. Chair votes aye. Ms. Parks. Aye. Mr. Maxfield. Aye. Mr. Meadows. Aye. Mr. Gilbert. Aye. It's unanimous. We are adjourned. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Thanksgiving. Thank you. Happy Thanksgiving.